In his house at Rullier, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. I wanted to make this painting for a long time. To begin, I get my paper very thoroughly soaked since I knew I'll be adding a lot of layers and doing a lot of blending for this piece. To achieve an ominous and stormy sky atmosphere, I begin with a basic gradient of mid-tone greens, blending and darkening as I go along. I'm using a wide, flat synthetic brush to add large amounts of wet poster paint for the clouds and blending in an uneven manner with my hake brush to get the cloudy texture I want. I'm also cleaning my smaller brush and using it without fresh paint to lift away some pigment to make highlights in the clouds. The paints I use for the background are my Sakura poster colors, which I really enjoy using for backgrounds because of how opaque and bold the colors are, even when watered down and spread out quite a bit on the paper. I can cover a whole page very easily without needing much paint at all. I also have a secondary, smaller hake brush I use to avoid accidentally smearing or blending paint where I don't want it. Having several clean brushes of various sizes on hand is a huge asset when working quickly before the paper dries. When my paper is more dry, I begin adding and layering some lighter spots of paint and gently dry brushing them as needed. I also use my synthetic brush to add some off-black cloud spots to really accent the looming and foreboding atmosphere that I want to achieve. Here's something I didn't show off in my last video. To make my paintings, I do an initial series of sketches before settling on a design I like and making a cleaned up drawing to trace onto my page. My method of transferring the image is about as basic as it gets. I just rub some soft graphite from a pencil onto the back of my paper, and when I trace over my lines again, this copies the lines down. Once that's complete, I begin going over the pencil in gouache with my number 5 paintbrush. This helps me keep track of things in my head while I'm blocking in colors. Once I'm satisfied with things, I start to fill in some initial base layers of color that I'll come back to later. While I'm doing this, I'm really thinking about the values of my painting as well, not just the hue of the colors, but how light or dark the paint is. I'm making the areas of shadow very deep with my olive green and black Windsor Newton gouache. The inside of the idol's wings, the lower body, and the claws on the feet are all parts I wanted in shadow, and you'll see me do that in a moment. A lot of this painting was just patiently layering and blending more and more paint until I got the result I wanted. I spent a good number of hours steadily adding more paint, doing my best not to paint outside of the outlines I drew earlier. As I go along, I begin to add some spots of lighter pigment as well, and even begin some rough blending into the darker parts of the paint I've already laid down. This next step will be really helpful later. Like the clouds in the sky earlier, I take a clean, damp brush and begin to lift away some paint so that when I go over these parts again with some much lighter pigment, they won't become muddy or begin to mix in ways I don't want. This is a fairly slow process, and I occasionally use a tissue to dab away some areas that don't have as much fine detail. Later on, this abstract shape will become a splash of ocean water that I thought would make a cool accent. Given the pulp magazine origins of this character, I thought I'd add some thematically fitting element of flair to capture the viewer's eyes, drawing their attention upwards towards the face of this ancient stone idol. At this point, I begin to add more large patches of color as I work on balancing the values throughout this piece. I had several ideas I wanted to implement for this painting, and now is a good time to go into those details. Because this painting is fairly monochromatic, mostly light yellow greens and dark blue greens, I wanted to make sure the foreground and background stood out from each other very clearly. One trick I used was to cheat the lighting of this painting. The sky in the background is very light at the horizon and gets darker as it goes higher, whereas the lighting on the figure is very light at the top and gets progressively darker further down the figure. My goal was that even if someone looking at my painting was colorblind, or if the image was only in black and white, the values of the painting would be very easy and clear to read. Another trick you don't see in this footage is how I would take breaks from painting to step back and look at my painting from a distance to check if things were reading clearly at a smaller scale. I also took a lot of quick photos on my phone and used the black and white photo editing option to quickly turn them grayscale and see what areas were not reading as clearly as I needed them to. Once I became aware of parts of the painting that needed to be darkened or lightened, I would just go back to them, slowly and steadily adding more layers, blending as needed. 
To help keep me focused while making this painting, I played through the audiobook I have of The Call of Cthulhu several times over. It's a fairly short story, and yet it never fails to captivate and entertain me. If you haven't had a chance to read it, The Call of Cthulhu by American horror author Howard Phillips Lovecraft was originally published in Weird Tales magazine in February of 1928. The story focuses around the accidental discovery of a completely unknown cult that worships a nightmarish entity known as Cthulhu. The figure of Cthulhu is revealed in greater detail when a meeting of archaeologists is interrupted by the arrival of a detective in search of knowledge regarding a mysterious artifact that he and his men captured during a raid. The archaeologists are fascinated by this wholly alien artifact that is completely unidentifiable to them. The inspector explains that it belonged to a loathsome and completely unknown cult. The small idol was carved in a soapy greenish-black stone and represented some sort of a horrible monster, part octopus, part dragon, and part man. I've been a fan of Lovecraft's writing for many years now, and as I said at the beginning, I've wanted to make this painting for a long time. In spite of the fact that his writings were really never that popular or famous during his life, the Cthulhu mythos and its legacy has gone on to be an inspiration for countless other books, movies, and games, even solidifying its own subgenre of weird science fiction, cosmic horror. Although I'm not usually a fan of horror, there's something really unique about Lovecraft's writing. Not to mention, I have a soft spot for bad, campy B-movie horror, the kind of movies that are less scary and more fun to watch with popcorn, and maybe have a few good laughs at some particularly bad special effects. Thankfully, if you go digging, there are plenty of, pardon the pun, cult classics inspired by the stories Lovecraft wrote. I really wanted to pay a loving tribute to this spooky story that's brought me so much entertainment, and I'm really pleased with how things came out. Plus, it's always a treat to get to use my metallic gold gouache paint. I rarely have an excuse to use this stuff, and I couldn't think of a more fitting place to add it. Also worth mentioning, because of how old Lovecraft's works are, pretty much all of his writings and characters, including Spooky Cthulhu here, have gone into the public domain. So if you want to make your own stories, art, and games involving the mythos, go ahead and get creative. Anyways, now that I'm satisfied with how the idol has turned out, I can turn my focus to the other elements of the painting, like the rocky ocean pedestal the idol is sitting on, and the spray of seawater. I've hardly ever had a chance to paint water before, and this was a really fun challenge, drawing something so organic and full of motion. Here, I used some Prussian blue and even a bit of sky blue to achieve that watery color gradient I really wanted. Since the idol isn't that big in the story, only about 7 or 8 inches in height, I didn't want to paint a massive crash of water with a lot of spray and sea foam. Instead, I tried to paint a smaller splash of ocean water with only a few extra droplets spraying into the air. Less of a crash and more of a splash. The yellow, green, and blue palette I used for this painting is very analogous and creates a rich, vivid color scheme. Like I said earlier, if I could achieve the look and aesthetic of an old pulp magazine cover, I'd consider this piece a success. And now for my favorite part, getting to see the finished piece with its clean edges. I'm really happy with how this painting turned out. It was a real challenge and many hours of work, but the result was totally worth it. Thank you for joining me on this painting adventure. Ia Cthulhu